There are very adaptable species. Swamps, trees, deserts, rainforest. Many hunt down their prey. Others lie in wait, knowing dinner will come along eventually on four legs, maybe two. Rob Riddle sticks his hands into tree trunks, desert holes, and goes headlong in a search for the long and lithe, the fanged and deadly. It's the strike or be struck world where killer instinct fuels the Australian pythons. Pythons are the most ancient group of snakes on the planet. And Australia has more than 50% of all the pythons in the world. It could be called the land of the python. And I find this one here, or this group or species, the carpet python, very special. In its domain, the python is one of the most dominant creatures, high on the food chain. There are few creatures that would dare attack an adult python, but we've got Rob with us. Brown tree snakes are common little snakes. They live up the east coast and right across the top of Australia. What I'm really here for is a special python, and it only lives in the rainforest. And this is it, known appropriately as the jungle carpet python. This medium-sized python, with a head which has been likened to the head of a dragon, reaches a length of about one and a half to two metres, or five to seven feet. Rob is searching this area of northern Australia. He finds plenty of creatures to catch his imagination. Ah. Or not, but sometimes you have to dig a little to find the treasure. I just love rotten logs. Yes. Gotcha. don't want to get bitten by this little fellow. It's a small-eyed snake, nocturnal, and even though he's small, he packs a punch. The venom destroys muscle tissue. I'll put him back. Rob always wants answers to the questions he observes. Why do some pythons grow large and others not? This is his quest up here in the hot and steamy tropics. Using all his skills learned as a hunter and tracker, Rob is not hesitant to dive headlong into his research. He knows the habitats and behaviours of many of the animals he calls friends. Slaty grey snake, and they love living in the cracks of the rocks. They're harmless, they do bite a lot. And when they do, they actually bite and they chew, see? They actually chew. They don't let go, they chew, and they cut like a razor blade. They just chew and they chew and they chew! Ah! Okay, you can let go. They just chew, chew, chew. <laughs> You'd swear they were deadly, but they're totally harmless. Now this is a good looking spot. I can actually smell one. Rob's picked up the secretions from the musk glands of his hunted target. Yes. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> gotcha. What a beauty. Now, this is what I've been after. It's the jungle carpet. It doesn't grow much bigger than this. Oh, and they're savage little devils. Ah. Yes. <laughs> now you want to have a bit of a bite, eh? <laughs> yes. Ah. They just, just wants to bite me, that's all. <laughs> just wants to bite me. <laughs> Look at him. Sadly, the niche for the bigger python in the rainforest has been taken over by the scrub python. Now, outside of the rainforest, you get big carpets. But this one is only found in the rainforest. As we've seen, the jungle python has a reputation for being very nervous and a nippy kind of snake. After Rob put him back, he was a little hard to avoid, and Rob's film crew also got a taste of that bite. Or rather, the python got a taste of them. Even the director would not be obeyed, and now carries the scars to prove it. Rob is hunting a whole range of Australian pythons. He climbs trees to find answers. He travels to deserts to track down pythons who seem to float above the scorching sands. Then, deep into the heart of Australia, 
he organises a kayak expedition deep into unique Mud Island, where he does a little detective work and finally tackles the biggest there is. Rob's next quarry is this fella. He loves it wet and wild, so Rob has to get his feet wet. Now the water python or swamp python I'm searching for doesn't look much different to his cousin, the spotted python. Now the spotted python can live in the desert with absolutely no water. But the water python, you'll never find him anywhere else except near water in the swamp. This species ranges across the tropical north of Australia in the Torres Straits, the south coast of New Guinea, plus Indonesia. They also have a snappy temperament that comes with maturity. Yes, beauty! Swamp python. And this one's been in the wars a bit. He's got a few scars on him, I can see. He's got a, the end of his tail missing. Now these fellows eat birds, ducks and things, eggs, and even little crocodiles. But then crocodiles do eat these fellows too. On his neck he's got these scars, you can see he's had a go, something torn in through here. Sealed over though. And he's only his tail missing, that could have been from a crocodile. Stumpy tailed one. Yeah. He's also caught a rainbow snake in the sun. Rainbow pattern, but then all the Australian pythons have a rainbow pattern. Stands out this fellow a lot more because he's just a plain brown colour. Hasn't really got much else going for him except the rainbow pattern. Nice yellow belly though. Always got a bright yellow belly. And not aggressive either. They're a rather placid snake. An Aboriginal myth tells the story of this rainbow serpent, which created all the rivers and valleys of northern Australia with its iridescent coloured body. Now they're excellent climbers, like most pythons. Climb really, really well. That helps when you eat birds and eggs. Nature is opportunistic. This python inhabits watercourses, swamps and billabongs that adjoin woodland or forests. Why? Birds also need these water areas for survival. So the water python has moved in and set up shop as the resident bad guy. But that's just another name for survival. is taken whole. Why break it and lose food when you can dislocate your jaw and get the entire contents, packaging and all? Rob then moved out of the confines of the rainforest. He wanted to see the python swimming freely. It wasn't long till he spotted one. There's one down there. Water pythons just don't live in swamps. They also live in rivers. This is Australia's only python that can't live without water. Because of the dry nature of Australia, almost all the other pythons only drink when it rains. He's also a python that's losing his infrared heat receptors. He's only got three on each side and two small ones on the front. And I think it's because of the environment he lives in. Water holes, rivers, where all animals have to come to drink. All his prey comes to him, a bit like the crocodile. Leaving all that water behind, Rob heads inland to the vast western desert of Queensland. All at once, this is a beautiful and unforgiving Australian place in what is known as the Dry Continent. 
I'm a thousand miles from the east coast of Australia, but if you go anywhere in Australia, a thousand miles from any coast, you're in a desert. And even out here, you'll find carpet pythons, but they're not just anywhere. Down there, we've got three kinds of habitats. Wide open plains, way over there, we've got sand hills, and we've got tree-lined creeks. What's really important to the carpet pythons out here are those tree-lined creeks. In fact, it's the only place you'll find them. The great deserts of Australia are an arid, inhospitable place where few things survive the extremes of heat and lack of water. But this species, like the water python, has made it the best he can. They are not in abundance, as Rob found out, but if a species can find just one item to factor in their survival, they will subsist. Trees are the main reason why he's able to live here. And that's because if there's any birds in the area, it's the only place they can nest or roost, and it's the only place the possums can live. And they are the animals he is best designed to hunt for. Now I've noticed a hollow in this bloodwood tree and I can see it's been chewed around the edges, which means a parrot's been living in it. And down here, lots of droppings. And if you're gonna find a desert carpet anywhere, it's gonna be in a hollow tree, and probably where something's been living, he's had a feed. And there's a lot of ants here too. <laughs> Rob climbs to see if anyone's home. I've been searching for two days to find an occupied hollow. I mean, occupied by a desert carpet. It's not easy out here, but I've got one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> come on, you beauty, come on. Come on, come on. I've got to be gentle, I don't want to hurt the girl. Or the boy, whatever it is. Come on, come on, come on, come on. It's a bit hard, I've really got to hang on with my knee, but I haven't got this one. Beauty, come on, come on. Oh, what a beauty. Oh, yes. I bet she's got a belly full of parrots. <laughs> okay. For the average person, it doesn't look much different to a coastal carpet, except for the colour. But there's something else that's different. We just don't know about. It's not just colour. I reckon if you brought a coastal carpet out here, it wouldn't make it. But then, mysteries abound in this place. It's said you can get a long way in a long time out here, and you've got to be made of stern stuff if you call this home. Rob continues west, deeper into the heart of the continent. If you do happen to cark it out here, you probably won't rot your mummify like this poor little bit of dragon did. Out here, in the centre of Australia, and I mean the dead centre of Australia, in a very small area of about 50,000 square miles, lives a very special kind of python. Now, he's really special to me because it's named after my father. It's the Bredles python. Now he's different from any other carpet python because he's got more scales on his head and more scales on his body. Why? I don't know. I bet you've been wondering how I found this. Well, I've been watching him for a while. It's this time in the afternoon when the heat's gone that the creatures in the desert start to move around. I've been seeing a lot of lizards and I just watched him go into that clump of grass. This is the Bredles python. Now, he's only young. He's got a small head and a big body. He could be two or three years old. And that makes me excited because that means they're breeding out here. They're doing well. It's a good sign. You can see how he blends into the rock. Almost perfect camouflage. Now the only difference between this carpet and all the others is it's got more scales on its head and on its body. They're smaller. So it looks more like a skin. Now I don't know any reason why it should have more scales, but I reckon it makes them look more beautiful because it looks like skin rather than scales. 
this Brettles carpet python has lots and lots of heat sensors right around the top jaw and along the bottom jaw. And I suppose in the colder nights of the desert, it makes it easier for him to find little warm-blooded animals and birds that are probably more widespread than other places. It makes it easier for him to hunt. <laughs> When going deep into the Aussie desert, you need a Rob Breddle who can look at a barren landscape and see it teeming with life. They may not be the most obvious things, but if you're a bit of a reptile freak like me or a young snake, lizards are everywhere out here. Yes. I just noticed a lizard run in there. Now, it's not the size of that hole. That tells you how big the lizard is. That's where Gowana tried to dig him out, but probably run into trouble in the roots. That's why he's still alive. I'll see if I can get him out, though. I'll have to break this bush out first. Gee whiz. It's tough. You're going right up there. Got him. These little skinks have an escape hole. And the goanna digs here, they pop out over here. <laughs> I was lucky I saw the ground move. And he's right between my fingers, right here. Look, here he comes. There he is. It's a little stripy skink. And that's his escape hole. I'll let him go out there again, watch. There he goes, there. This is called the dead heart, and its soil is blood red. Almost all of the Australian snakes start off their lives eating lizards. In fact, the enormous success of the Australian snakes is due to the lizards. Even the pythons rely on lizards when they're younger. Most of them, however, graduate to warm-blooded animals, except for two, the Wama python and the blackhead. The carpet pythons didn't make it to the sand dunes, and that's probably because there are not very many larger, warm-blooded animals living there. What did make it was a smaller python called a Stimson's python and a much larger, unusual python called a Wamma. So the search is on for the telltale and individual track marking left by that larger Wamma python. The Wamma is a medium-sized python reaching about 2.5 metres or around 8 feet in length. Wommas have a reputation among enthusiasts as the most laid-back, easy-to-handle snake on Earth. They lack the classic dragon head of many pythons and, like Rob Brettle, move across the sand in a most unusual way. They raise their bodies above the scorching sand and make as little contact with it as possible. It also kills unlike other pythons. It uses its head as a shovel to expand the burrows of its prey. They then trap and crush their prey against the burrow wall. The tracks in the sand they leave is as individual to the species as a fingerprint. Rob's closing in. This Wama seems to be doing his best not to make a track. The afternoon shadows are lengthening, and Rob's at the Wommer's front door. I've been following these tracks for a while now, and by the straightness of them, I know it can't be a King Brown. It's not a carpet in the sand dunes. They don't live here. I think it's got to be a Wommer. I'll see if I can get him out. I wonder how deep he is. Let him down. He's too deep. Got to dig. I can just reach him. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, mate. Oh, he's pulling back. He doesn't want to come. Can't blame him. Here he comes, here he comes. I've got him. <laughs> come on. OK, mate, OK. Nice and gently does it. <laughs> A Wama python, king of the sand dunes. Now, you might notice he doesn't have any heat sensors on his mouth. He's a real reptile eater. There's only two pythons out here that do this, the Wamba python and the blackhead. Strictly reptile eaters. Definitely no infrared heat-seeking pits on his mouth. None. 
strictly uses this tongue to track his prey down. What a little beauty. Rob sends him on his way to get on with his hunt. Rob now moves his attention offshore. Back on the east coast of Australia, the crew lash sea kayaks to a powerboat to get them as close as possible to their destination. There's a good reason for the kayaks. The powerboat can go no further and a creek must be negotiated. And all this gear, including camera equipment, survival and camping gear, has to be carried on board the kayaks to the centre of the island. With a powerboat to rendezvous on tomorrow's high tide, it's an expedition with a tight time limit. If the tide is too low, they will be literally stranded up a creek. But what's Rob looking for? There are a lot of different kinds of carpet pythons, and they inhabit just about every part of Australia. But what's really special about them is unlike other pythons, the carpet python seems to do very well on small remote islands. Finding a suitable campsite is the first order of business. shows us his kayak extraction technique. The camp is established and Rob can't wait to get out amongst the island wildlife. I'm on a 640 acre mangrove swamp called Mud Island and in the middle of it it's got a tiny patch of rainforest and in there lives a carpet snake and he's been there for thousands of years. I'm going to try and find one and maybe find out why they're here. Now I've paddled up this creek here and I'm camped about here and there's that patch of trees, that little bit of rainforest. I've got to get over there. I'll just climb this tree and see if I can see it. The surrounding vegetation is thick, so for Rob to get his bearings, the only way is up. So I can see where I've got to go. I've climbed this little tree. So I can see that little patch of rainforest. And it's just over there. It doesn't look more than about 400 metres away. There's no way you can go through, it's just a mud swamp. I have to go out and follow the pandanus trees, I reckon that's where the more solid ground is. Come around that side. Rob is not just travelling to a destination. He uses the time to examine all the clues he can find to map the wildlife habitat as well. Here's a rat hole. Now I'd never imagine there'd be rats on this island. How they got here, couldn't have a clue, probably on driftwood. But that's one of the reasons why that carpet snake's surviving. And here's that rat's little larder. He's running around picking up pandanas, carrying them back in here and then chewing them up. <laughs> Keeps him hidden. The island is well named and the going is slow in the swampy mine. What's called Mud Island. This could be tough going. Ah, jeez. Gotta try and keep to the vegetation. Hold you up a bit. When you get into the middle of this island, 
The mangroves are just that high, you can't see over them. Very easy to get lost. At times, Rob feels like he's going backwards. I've been trudging for about a half an hour and I'm still about 400 metres away. The bog underfoot dries and firms a little as the little rainforest draws near. Well, I finally made it. Now, if I'm going to find one of these carpet snakes, it's either going to be in a hollow log, hung up in the vine somewhere, or curled up in some rubbish. Even this microcosm of rainforest supports a complement of creatures. And Mud Island's rainforest, like many, holds the unique, so there are surprises for Rob. That's a very unusual little flycatcher. I've never seen one like that before. Now, that little bird nearly landed on you. It's a feature of island birds. Having very little contact with humans, they've got no fear of us. Rob still hasn't found the carpet snake he came to find here on Mud Island. Mm. Bones of a fairly big bird. Leg. Well, that's his beak. It was a young seagull. It's not big enough to be an adult. Just one that didn't make it. But the evidence is growing. Believe it or not, this is a Nankeen night heron's nest. Wouldn't take much for a carpet snake to get to this one, and by the looks of it, no poo, no eggs. Probably did got mum. Ah. My first sign of a snake, skin, a shed skin. Now it's not a fresh one, it's pretty old. Now it's a python, I can tell that from the belly scales, and from the size of the scales, I can tell you it's a fairly big snake, so they're doing pretty well. It may be a relatively small area, but there are plenty of places for a snake to hide. But Rob is an amazing bush detective, and soon the clues all point to the whereabouts of the prime suspect. There's one here, and he's shedding his skin. Rob, as usual, lends nature a helping hand and helps the snake shed its skin. Most snakes shed four to eight times per year. The frequency of shedding depends on many factors, including climate, age and activity level. Some snakes can get a little more aggressive than usual during this process. Didn't like being picked up, do you, mate? <laughs> Wants to bite me. I'm just trying to help you out of your skin, mate. We'll thank you for it later. Just going to shed his skin. Probably why he was holed up there. Just coming on. Right time. Come on, mate, come on. I'll catch him again in a minute, but what I want to do is compare his skin to the one I found. I kept a bit of it. Here it is. Now you can see the width of the belly on this one. If we look at the width of his belly, you'll notice the belly on the big one is at least twice as big, as wide and as thick as the little one. And same with the size of the scales. If you look at the scale size, they're huge when you compare them to his. Get that opened. There you see. There are their scales, and look at the size of his scales. Now you can see both the belly scales and the body scales about twice as big on the old skin. So that means it's from one about twice the size of this one, twice as long, which means it's one around about three and a half metres. So this is about 1.8 metres. So that was a really big snake. 
I'd like to find him. He has become the top predator here, and, as Rob mentioned earlier, evidence shows this species has survived on Mud Island for about a thousand years. He must live here because he's gone right back to where I caught him before. Being a small area, this fellow just might be a descendant. Come on, mate. Come on, Edge, come. <laughs> here you go. All clean now. Left his skin. So you can see, as I said, he's a good 1.8 metre snake. He's hissing a lot. That's not surprising, he's just being caught. To me, he doesn't look much different to the other carpet pythons on the mainland. But then that's not too surprising to me because this island's only about five kilometres off the coast near the mouth of a river. So new carpet snakes are probably getting flooded in here every so often. So it doesn't look like he's changing like some of the other snakes on islands around Australia are. We'll put him back, let him go, let him grow as big as his dad or his mum. The day was shutting down, so Rob went out to catch dinner. Now on the bottom of this lagoon, everywhere, there's these whelks, and they're edible. I'd prefer a fish or a crab, but if you're stuck, these are good food. Whelks are actually a snail, so you can see why Rob passed these for this. Yes! <laughs> you little beauty, look at that. A mud crab from <laughs> Mud Island. I know what I'm having for dinner tonight. <laughs> I reckon a carpet python would survive in an outback dunny. Seriously. Not only do you find them on islands like this, but from the rainforests to the deserts, as long as they've got trees and rocky outcrops. If there's food there, they'll adapt to find it. Following a night of fighting off mosquitoes, it was time to catch the tide for the rendezvous with the powerboat. Now, let's hope Captain Smith set his alarm clock. Just behind me there, on the side of that little hill called Mount Etna, was the site of one of Australia's great conservation battles to save a tiny bat. Now, you might ask, what's that got to do with pythons? Well, for a couple of months each year, pythons up there do a very strange thing. Rob climbs for the best position to witness a once-a-year event. This Mount Etna is in Australia and is primarily constructed of limestone. That cleft cave behind me here is a unique shaped cave. It goes into the ground as if I drove my fist into the ground and then turn my fingers up in two little points here which creates caverns where the body heat of the parent bats is trapped to create a natural humidity crib for the hairless babies. But for Rob, there is always a diversion. That beautiful caterpillar there is probably the caterpillar to the hawk moth. The caves are important for the continuing life cycle of the bats. The females leave for a nursery cavern which has a special dome shape that allows the heat to rise for the natural humidity crib properties Rob mentioned earlier. The babies are born in December and are packed together in pink masses on the cave walls. Their mothers leave them at night to feed. Rob is taking us to see this amazing event. The cleft here is about 90 feet deep and the nursery caverns are about 40 feet high. Now it might look lifeless, but down there it's teeming with life. Now this is, in fact, the major little bent-winged bat nursery in Australia. This discoloration here is from the ammonia coming up from this cave, which comes from the bat urine. Now it is that strong down there 
that if we were to attempt to go down, we'd need breathing apparatus. If we went down there, we'd probably die. Cool. I don't know how they stand it. Dusk approaches. You could set your watch by the exit timing of the colony. And Rob's got the best seat in the house. In this particular cave, I estimate about 110,000 adult bats, about 80,000 juveniles, and in the area with the males and juvenile females from last year, some three to 400,000 bats rely on these caves here. This mass of bats would take about 45 minutes to exit this cave, and by the time they return in the morning, they'll have eaten more than one tonne of insects. What has this to do with snakes? Rob finds the answer with his torch. They're waiting to feed, but it's not just pythons come to this evening's feast. We've got a brown tree snake here. Now, like all snakes, he's got an exceptionally good sense of smell using his tongue against a Jacobson's organ on the roof of his mouth. Now, this is supposedly able to pick up one molecule of scent on a cubic metre of air. 100,000 bats here, so he found it through smell. And it's just going to wait here till one comes close enough. Then hopefully he'll whack it. Now the brown tree snake is a venomous snake, but he's got rear fangs, and the venom is not very toxic to humans, but very toxic to birds and possibly bats. He also wraps it up a bit like a python does to hang on. What looked like a lifeless hole before, look at it now. <laughs> just thousands upon thousands of these little bats. The brown tree snake seems to defy gravity on the sheer wall. He stretches out to catch a bat. Hanging in mid-air, he sniffs the air and braces the lunge. It just takes time and patience. Because the bats are so fast, it's a game of chance. He just waves his head, and if one comes close enough, he might get a feed. But I think sometimes they miss out. But eventually, he finds success. Now he has to work out how to cling to a vertical rock wall and wrap up his dinner at the same time. Night after night, the killing spree continues. This children's python is small, but he and his kin prove again that the killer instinct is born from opportunity and adaptation to survive. If you want to find the top predator in the North Australian rainforest, you've got to come to a place like this. The king of the jungles in Northern Australia is not a tiger, it's a python. And he's probably the reason why the feisty little jungle carpet only grows to about one and a half metres or five feet long. In here, the bigger python takes care of the fruit bats, the possums, the larger birds and the wallabies. Rob is hunting the largest python in Australia, the amethystine. It gets its name from the iridescence all pythons share, but none share his enormous size when fully grown. Now that just leaves the smaller rats and birds for the jungle carpet. There's just no need for him to get any bigger. Not only does this look like a good spot to find one, I can actually smell there's one living here. Our pythons have scent glands either side of their anus, musk glands. And as they move, they leave a scent. And if they live in a spot, the scent is stronger. What a beauty. Now, this is only a small one, about three metres long. Now, a lot of the Australian pythons grow to about three metres, and they're considered reasonably big in world terms. Now, see what he's doing? I've got him by the neck, so he's going to wrap me up. And if he was bigger, I could be in trouble. A couple of things I'd like to show you here. Now, nearly all of the pythons have heat sensors on the side of their face, on the bottom jaw. They're infrared sensors. 
That enables him to find a bird at night, because snakes have got very, very poor eyesight. And this fellow's also got him on the end of his nose, very directional, and he is a, a bird eater. Long, thin snake, does a lot of climbing, and as you can see with the size of his head, he can put away a fair-sized bird. Now Rob's after a fully grown specimen. And when you encounter a snake at the length of a school bus, even he has to keep his wits about him. Here's a fairly big one. It's an amethystine python, just resting on the other side of this rock. Now, if you have to tangle with an amethystine python about this size, you've got to be a bit careful. He's got a huge head about as big as my hand with 80 sharp teeth. If he bites you, he'll puncture every blood vessel in your arm. You'll bleed like a stuck pig, swell up, lots of bruising. But not only that, if he wraps you up, you can be in trouble. This one is big enough to kill you. Now he can't run away, he can't move very fast, so he's in the defensive mode. We're coming close, he'll have a few strikes at me. Don't try this at home. Got him. <laughs> now, when I grab him behind the head, I don't hold him very tight. If I did, you watch, he'll start to wrap. You throw a coil up, he's going to try and wrap me up. Coil going around the arm there. But if I let his head go, he'll try and escape. So I'm not going to let him wrap me up. Let him go off, see? Don't restrict him. So he's not going to wrap me. All I have to do now is basically stick his head in the bag and let him crawl in. He's wrapping me leg up now. <laughs> you see that? Try not to let him wrap up. He's a fairly good size too, look. I'd say about 16 feet. Now all I have to do now is basically stick his head in the bag, if I can, <laughs> and let him crawl in. On you go, mate. That's the easiest way to catch a big snake. In you go. It's handy to have that little hoop there. In you go. <laughs> Just as well he hasn't got arms. <laughs> Just as well they're not fast either. Like I said, it's a cool morning. On a hotter day, it'd be a bit more of a handful. I reckon you must weigh about 50, 60 pounds, yes! In the jungles of North Queensland, it's not a mammal that's the top predator. It's this fellow, the amethystine python. Now he's reputedly the third longest snake in the world and has been recorded at eight metres long, that's about 28 feet. Big enough to eat a person and there have been attacks on people in Australia but as of such, no one's been eaten yet. And he's probably the reason the jungle carpet up here doesn't grow bigger than about one and a half metres. Even though pythons are harmless, big ones like this can be very dangerous. In fact, they can kill their prey much quicker than poison snakes do. What they do is they wrap you up right around your body, And Titan, you better help me here. <laughs> Nothing, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. Got him now. <laughs> what they do is they wrap you up, and when you let a breath go, they just tighten. You never get another breath. Ah! Big ones like this can be dangerous. <laughs> I'm Rob Brettle, and thanks for joining me on Killer Instinct. Saltwater crocodiles are one of the most treacherous animals on the planet. Yet this man just knowingly entered its territory. 
We've all heard of never smile at a crocodile. How about kissing them? When it comes to all creatures great and terrifying, it seems no one understands what lies in the heart of a killer like this man. This is Rob Brettel, and right here is where he comes face to face with the killer instinct. They are one of the world's most misunderstood creatures. Supremely adapted, they're designed by evolution to survive in the harshest conditions, with honed natural talents for the hunt and kill. Feared by many, revered by others, they always evoke extreme reactions from humans and prey alike. Especially when you look into their eyes and truly see the killer instinct of snakes. The crocodile. The mere mention of its name can strike fear in the human heart. Is this because it's a vicious and violent killer? But this man can kiss crocodiles. These efficient predators outlived the dinosaurs and have deadly hunting equipment. They know a meal will walk right into their home. When that time comes, you'll see the killer instinct of crocodiles. Shark. The very word strikes fear into most of us. They are one of the most numerous and successful carnivores on Earth. At the top is the great white shark. Together with the highly intelligent killer whale, these extraordinary predators command the seas across the globe. But how do they hunt? Do they use strategy? And do they deliberately target humans? Is it just survival, or is it all just the killer instinct of sharks? As a killing machine, there are few wild beasts to rival these. They reign supreme over most other creatures in their domain. They are fiercely territorial and defend it aggressively. One look into the eye of the tiger, or the lion, or the cougar, is a warning. Don't mess with this cat. If you have a survival instinct, you know they have the killer instinct of the big cats. You're a small rodent, maybe an insect, and stalking you is a member of the reptilian master species. The eyes, the teeth, the jaws are designed to kill prey. The advantages that put this predator at the top of the food chain doesn't have to be speed. For the largest of this species, it's the bite that kills. Don't mistake them for Jurassic dinosaurs. They're alive and well today, surviving with a killer instinct of lizards. Like thieves in the night, they lie in wait. Camouflaged, patient, deadly. They're not even insects, they're arachnids. If you knew how many spiders were within a 25-foot radius of where you are right now, you'd probably freak. But they can play a positive role in the ecosystem. This doesn't mean you have to be any less afraid when confronted by this or this. And not many of us can understand this. Prepare to be fascinated, repulsed and amazed as we examine the killer instinct of spiders. As the sun sets over the Australian bush, there is a sound that strikes fear. A sound that echoes in history and chills the hearts of many who have come to know its raw killing power. They hunt in packs, protect their territory, and use their wolf-like cunning and agility to run down the fastest native and domesticated animals, and occasionally, even humans. In Australia, the name for public enemy number one is the dingo because of his killer instinct. Aggression, a major key to survival. 
In a matter of seconds, cute and cuddly turns astoundingly vicious. Yeah. Ow, 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 ow. Related to Australia's best known icons, these mysterious fur balls live their lives fast and furious. With bad attitudes and razor teeth bared, these feisty little creatures can pack a whole lot of punch, proving that size does not matter to the carnivorous marsupials. Just the size of their killer instinct. A flash of black wing, an evil raspy call, a darting glance, and an attack. They're the birds we moved in with. They adapted to us, but don't mess with the crow or the dive-bombing magpie. And don't take your eyes off that owl, because the butcher bird could still be close by. Their lilting song may hide their true intent, but they could be watching us in our backyards right now with the killer instinct of the urban birds of prey. There's pain in these waters, and it's not sharks. It's something quick, ugly, and almost invisible. The fear factor on Australian beaches is heard as screams of agony. These marine creatures have built up defences that use an arsenal of projectiles, hollow barbs, ribbons of pain, chemical warfare at the most ancient level. They'll take away your breath, your consciousness, your life. You won't believe what's down there to swallow you up in the killer instinct deep of ocean venom. There are very adaptable species. Swamps, trees, deserts, rainforest. Many hunt down their prey. Others lie in wait, knowing dinner will come along eventually on four legs, maybe two. Rob Riddle sticks his hands into tree trunks, desert holes, and goes headlong in a search for the long and lithe, the fanged and deadly. It's the strike or be struck world where killer instinct fuels the Australian python. Rob Brettel learned a lot of his amazing crocodile handling abilities in far northern Australia from 1972. Here he caught and bred thousands of crocs back from near extinction. And now he's going back to rekindle some old friendships and a few bad ones as he feeds, wrangles, births and catches crocodiles. He even gets in a little fishing on the way to discover it's the killer instinct that has made the crocodile built to kill.